And now we move on to private members' uh, business. And the motion re workers' rights. I call on and talk to Collins, is it, to move? Would you please move the motion? Right. You have 20, you have 20 minutes now to share. I'm sharing with Deputy Harkin, 10 minutes Ten each. each. Yeah. Go on, right, lad. OK. Um, <coughs> Minister, um, the priorities of a government can be shown not just by what they do, um, but also what they don't do. And that is, is precisely what we are dealing with here. When it comes to weighing up workers' rights against the interests of employers and business, Fianna Fáil and Fianna Gael always know exactly where their priorities lie. I'm looking at your amendment, and I, that's the way I feel, and I know the workers feel. Following the insolvencies at Cleary's and Connolly Shoes, which left workers high and dry, the then Minister for Jobs and Enterprise, Richard Bruton, commissioned an expert review to examine possible changes to company and employment law to protect workers in these situations of tactical insolvency. The expert review, known as the Duffy Cahill Report, made six important recommendations. The report was welcomed by the Irish Congress of Trade Unions and the Cleary's workers, but was vehemently resisted in the uh, consultation process by the employer's body, IBEC. IBEC recommended no action, and surprise, surprise, that's exactly what happened. As I said, the priority of a government can be shown by what they don't do, um, and there you're an action to serve certain vested interests. So what precisely was called for in Duffy Cahill? They made six recommendations essentially to employment law. The first was to remove the exception of insolvency in relation to an employer notifying the Minister of collective redundancies, allowing all redundant workers the 30 days consultation period. This would give the unions um, the opportunity to negotiate and employees for at least 30 days get pay. Two, to impose a de facto obligation on a decision maker, that is a company whose actions may cause insolvency. The third recommendation, to increase the redress for workers given the failure to notify and consult. The fourth recommendation, probably the most important, is to give the state power to recover assets or proceeds to cover the cost to the state, and we say to the state, we're saying the taxpayer, in tactical insolvency. The fifth recommendation was the statutory power to injunct, and the sixth one was enhanced redundancy payment where an agreement a reasonable expectation of payment above the statutory two weeks. The recommendation in relation to assets is key to the solution facing the workers um, laid off by Debenhams in Ireland. If the Duffy Cahill recommendations had been implemented, then the state would be in a position to pay the four weeks redundancy due and then chase up Debenhams to recover the 10 million cost. Debenhams workers point out there's a stock worth 25 million in all the 11 stores in Ireland. KPMG, the liquidator, has valued the stock at 12.5 million at cost price, not the sale price. There's also the asset of Debenhams online business, which the workers reckon is worth up to 30 million, which was transferred out of Ireland to the UK this summer. The claim made by the Tarnister and the Minister for Jobs and Enterprise that Debenhams is not a tactical insolvency doesn't stand up to the facts, which are that assets were transferred to the UK and de debts were transferred from the UK to Ireland. The state must move to legislate um, and, and do so as an emergency measure. The Doyle has done emergency legislation numerous times over the last number of years, particularly in relation to bailing out the banks. The liquidator must be instructed to extend the consultation process while this leg legislation is being enabled. Indeed, the state, as a gesture of its good intentions, intentions should now pay the Debenham workers what they are owed from the Social Insurance Fund with the intention to recover the cost from Debenhams at a later date. Minister, this is, is an issue which is not going to go away. A tsunami of insolvencies can be expected in the next few months. 69,500 companies are availing of the wage subsidy scheme. 
Many will not survive as the scheme is reduced and phased out altogether. Even with the recommend recommendations of Duffy Cahill enacted in law, there will be circumstances whereby there will simply not be the liquidity or the assets to meet workers' entitlements. That is why I have raised in this motion the need for a special insolvency fund. Such funds exist in many EU countries and are used to pay redundancy, uh, redundancies, wages due, holiday pay, etc., to laid off workers. In Germany, this fund is resourced by a 0.6% payroll levy on employers. In Ireland, we have the lowest level of employers PRSI in the EU at 10.75%, less than half the EU average. And I know there will be a hue and cry from employers about um, tax on jobs, but this would be a solidarity insolvency fund. We pay our PRSI um, for health. It means that those workers who are healthy um, pay, for, pay into a fund to support those who are sick. The whole concept is solidarity, and this is what should be done here for workers who have been laid off through tactical insolvencies. I note in the Government Amendment it says, this is a useful suggestion to be examined. There is no commitment, and we can expect no action. Regarding the Government Amendments, rejection of the Duffel Cahy recommendations, what we have is a cut and paste job from IBEX submission to, cut to the consultation process set, set up after the report. And then we have a contradiction in your amendment. After stating clearly there is no need for any change, as per the review of the Company Law Review Group, we are promised yet another review. It is very clear this government has no intention of acting on these very important issues. Workers' rights, to my mind, that by this government are simply not a priority. I placed this private member's motion on the agenda today because those workers in Debenhams, ex-employees, last week took the action of occupying two stores. They raised the issue again when we debated in the Dáil, and what I was hoping that the government would come back with something much more urgent, much more thought out, and much more detailed in support of workers in the future, and these Debenham workers, and also the St Mary's Telford um, workers, um, who are, where the sisters of charity are trying to go into liquidation. Um, that's what we wanted today. We're not getting it. Um, but I'm really calling on this doll to make an exception for once, to make workers' rights the priority. Thank you, uh, Ken Corla. First of all, I'd like to congratulate my colleague, uh, John Collins, for bringing forward this motion, because I think it lays bare the completely unacceptable and totally disgraceful situation whereby redundant workers are being deprived of agreed redundancy payments due mainly to the transfer of company assets. I think the core question that we are asking here today is, how can the law protect employees during the redundancy process and help ensure that limited liability and corporate restructuring are not used to avoid a company's obligation to its employees. Minister, we have sound reasons to believe that the Duffy Cahill report provides many of the answers to that core question. Existing provisions do not work. We know that. We can see what has happened to the Cleary's workers and now the scandalous situation regarding the Debenhams workers. The Duffy Cahill report has, as its main objective, an examination into ways in which a similar occurrence can be avoided in the future. And that, of course, refers to what happened to the Cleary's workers. If some or all of those recommendations had been implemented, it's very likely that the Debenhams workers would be paid their rightful entitlements. As Duffy Cahill says in regard to the Cleary's workers, the transaction that produced this result 
may have been lawful, but it is difficult to avoid the conclusion that it would be preferable if it were not. And amen to that. Ask any of the exhausted Debenhams workers pounding the streets for over 100 days. Duffy Cahill looks at the situation where assets are separated from the operation and the operating entity subsequently becomes insolvent and goes into liquidation. And how, in those circumstances, we can ensure the legitimate interests of employees could be more effectively safeguarded. The report is comprehensive and it doesn't rush headlong into new legislative proposals. For example, it examines whether more effective use could be made of existing employment legislation. It looks at how employees could negotiate better terms and conditions beyond their statutory entitlements, whether employees' entitlements could be ring-fenced in the event of a transfer of an asset. And many other questions. Unfortunately, time doesn't allow me to go through them in detail. But the, the essential point here is, this is a considered, detailed report, which puts forward reasonable, credible and workable proposals to help safeguard redundant workers' entitlements. I know that you, as Minister, and your government do not want to see Debenhams workers left without their rightful entitlements. But expressing regret and sympathy is fine as far as it goes, but it is utterly useless. It's basically redundant for the redundant workers because it doesn't solve their problem and it won't solve similar problems in the future. So I think, Minister, everybody, no matter which side of the House you're on, recognises that we need to amend our legislation. And if nothing else, this report provides a sound basis for doing that. Now, I was particularly interested to look at some of the legislation that we now have in place and its inadequacies to protect workers who are made redundant uh, and companies transfer their assets. Now, much of this legislation is derived from EU directives. And while there are some protections in place, and I would instance the fact that over 1,500 redundant workers in Waterford Crystal were able to use EU legislation to vindicate their rights and entitlements, where the ECJ ruled in their favour and against this state in the case of underfunding of a company pension scheme. All I will say is, it is never easy to take on the power, the might and the resources of the state, but these workers did, and they established those rights not just for themselves, but for all Irish workers subsequently, and congratulations to them. But nonetheless, the forensic examination by Duffy Cahill of existing provisions in Irish law that derive from EU legislation shows that these provisions, as we already know, are inadequate to protect redundant workers in the situation of transfer of assets. We also know from the fact that certain European countries, for example, Germany and Austria, have unilaterally established levy funds on private sector employers for this very purpose, because EU legislation does not provide the required protections. Of course, one of the main reasons for this is the existence uh, of a strong tradition of collective bargaining in these countries, something that's missing in Ireland. But taking a closer look at some of the relevant legislation, the Protection of Employees Act provides for consultation of workers. 
However, Minister, it's telling that a successful case was taken against Ireland to comply with the requirements of the underlying directive, the Collective Redundancies Directive. And we had to comprehensively rewrite our legislation after we lost the case. Because we had legislation that allowed uh, employers to allow somebody else to control the operation and to basically hide behind uh, the situation where they would say, we didn't know what was going on. But the ECJ insisted we change our legislation. I mean, when I think that that get out clause was there in Irish law for employers, uh, it's just incredible and perhaps indicates uh, something far deeper about how we sometimes transpose EU legislation. And while I don't have time today to deal with that issue, it's certainly one of several examples that I know of where EU legislation was not transposed into Irish law with a view to protecting the individual, the ordinary person, the worker, but rather sought to insulate the state in some cases and corporate interests in other cases from adhering to the requirements of specific EU legislation. I was also most interested in the directive on the protection of employees in the transfer of undertakings, uh, that particular directive. But unfortunately, neither the directive itself nor our legislation provides any realistic mechanisms for protecting workers where, in cases, that the essential assets of the business, as opposed to the business itself, are transferred. So the conclusion is that none of our employment law, as it currently stands, could be safely relied upon to provide redress in the current situation. I think another area worth looking at is the Companies Act. And there are some possibilities here where any transfer of assets was conducted with the intention of perpetrating a fraud, for example, to deliberately deprive redundant workers of their rights. If you could prove this in a court of law, then you could have redress. However, tellingly, Duffy Cattle states that in regard to any court application, the likely complexity and the costs it would entail would make it an unattractive prospect for creditors with limited resources. And surely that describes the Debenhams workers, creditors with very limited resources. So, in simple language, Minister, no worker, no trade union, could attempt to use the provision in the Companies Act because they simply couldn't afford it. So finally, can I say that current legislation needs to be amended to provide protections to redundant workers in the case of transfer of assets. And Duffy Cahill lists six different proposals to deal with this. My colleague, John Collins, has gone through these proposals in detail, which, taken as a collective, could help to provide the missing safety net for workers who find themselves in the position that the Debenhams workers now find themselves in. I honestly believe these proposals are credible. I think they're well researched and I think they have a sound legal basis. And I'm asking you and your government to give them the serious consideration that these proposals deserve. We're about to go to talk to Anish uh, and um, Tara Stott. They know me.
just want to start with, I want to share with Deputy Collins, Conley, Fitzmaurice, Harkin, McNamara, Pringle, and I'm sure many other deputies who will contribute to this debate here tonight and who have spoken this same debate and this discussion on, in, previously over the last couple of months, that uh, the sympathy that they clearly hope the former, sta uh, that hope the former staff of Debenhams. Is this the way you want to go with it again? Well, you'd, you'd appreciate, just to, to be clear, that the, this debate was meant to happen this morning. And Minister Heather Humphreys was scheduled to take that debate and to lead off, and that I would close the debate as well, because there's a crossover between our two departments. With the changing of scenarios, I, I don't know what, what's in our diary at the moment, but I know there's a conflict and she could not be here today. But I think everyone knows what happened yesterday and today's business has completely changed. So I can't keep trying to explain to you that everyone does make an effort to be here, Deputy Barry, and you know that. But if you want to make that issue, that's your choice. I'd like to try to concentrate on what's helpful to the Devon's workers and what we're trying to do with them as well. That's, that's fine. Her presence in this chamber has been very regular and frequent, and I accept that if she could be here, she would be here. Absolutely, and had planned to be here this morning at 10 o'clock, I can confirm that, because I would have spoke to her on this issue quite a lot over the last couple of days, and I would have met with her last week again on this issue as well, as many others as well. But again, I want to say that we all share the sympathies, and I've met the evidence workers, and I've met a lot of the representatives. We've engaged quite a lot with Mandate, with two around this as well, and trying to tease through possible solutions and possible efforts that we can try to help them with their campaign. It is a difficult time for them, there's no doubt about that, and certainly those that are out uh, over the last probably 160 days at this stage, um, trying to campaign for their own, for, for their rights and their entitlements. That is very, very difficult. It's traumatic at the best of times, um, and it's a horrible experience for any worker to lose their jobs. It is an experience that many workers across Ireland are having at this moment as a result of the global pandemic, which only exacerbates the anxiety many workers feel as they re-enter a very uncertain jobs market. But certainly the timing of this made it even more difficult for the workers of Devon to be able to exercise their rights and be able to deal with this as well. And I recognise that too. And it was a case well made to me uh, by Iktu and, and, and by Patricia and by, by Jerry as well through mandate, trying to get across the, the significance of this and what's happened with Devlin's. Now, my understanding is from the, from the campaign around Devlin's and, and with their union, and I want to commend mandate and all the representatives and all the workers with them who try to champion their cause, try to work with them and negotiate. There was two aims there, was to realise their collective bargaining entitlements and their, 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 their hopes and aspirations there, what they had agreed to many, many years ago, but also to make sure that the system has changed to try to prevent this happening uh, others in the future and to make it, uh, I think as Deputy Maura Harkin said, that it's, the situation for redundant workers in the future is improved. And that's what their, their aims are. From, certainly when we met them, the Tosh, and myself, and Mr Triumph, the Taoiseach and many others, we are committed to working with them on that, working with the, as, a, as a group, as a sector, and this House here to see how we can strengthen legislation, to review Duffy Cahill and all that, and to make those changes if we can get agreement on that as well. That's what we are prepared to do and committing to working in that sector. Uh, other parts of your motion here, we can't commit to, and we put, and we put forward a counter motion, which I do move. Uh, and uh, again, I would seek the members to agree with our counter motion and to work with us in this space over the months ahead as we try to see: is there areas here? What, with the recommendations of Duffy Cahill and other recommendations, can we strengthen the position here uh, for employees and future redundancies? That's what we all would like to do as well. With the notable exception of large grocery outlets, the retail sector has perhaps been particularly affected by the measures, measures nations um, around the world have had to take in response to the, to the, to the spread of COVID-19. I've probably spent the last month at this stage going through every representative body uh, of the retail sector, trying to work through them, uh, the, what the future for the sector and trying to deal with the COVID fallout and what we can do to try to save as many jobs as we possibly can, but also to get back to a growth stage so we can increase the employment in the sector and strengthen the, the, the capacity of the, of the retail sector to employ more people and, and again to develop the skills in that area as well. So we are very committed to this as a sector because it's a major, major employer in Ireland and we want to build on that as well. In the case of Debenhams, it has also come through a number of turbulent years and an examinative process only to be dealt to the final blow, uh, fatal blow earlier this year in March. Sadly, of course, it's not the only retail outlet to experience a, a, a decline due to the change in nature of shopping habits and other external factors. And we are concerned uh, that there will be more closures to follow, both at home and abroad. We know that Debenhams UK is also in grave danger, battling to avoid liquidation and having to lay off staff. So this is a very turbulent space for many in this sector as well. As I said earlier, I want to applaud the workers and, and the representatives and, uh, and many of the deputies who have made the case for them as well, uh, to, who have campaigned to ensure that they get the best possible outcome from this very, very difficult situation. Uh, 
This government, as well as officials and relevant departments, including my own department of enterprise, of, uh, enter, of, of enterprise trade and employment, along with the Department of Employment Affairs and Social Protection, have engaged with the workers, with Mandate, with Trade Union, with ICTU. We have engaged with Devlin's UK Administration and sought advice from the Attorney General in an effort to assist where we can. Um, and we, are, we, are, we have been doing that over the last couple of months. There are also, uh, but again, there are unfortunately limits to what we can achieve for those particular workers at this present time. Well, everyone na is naturally wants to see uh, that their, their campaign is successful. There's only so much ministers are able to do, and that we can do as a government as well. Representations have previously been made by Mandit um, several months ago, seeking ministerial intervention in the consultation process that was ongoing at that time between the employer, the liquidators, and the workers and the representatives. This request was in the context of the Protection of Employees Employment Act 1977, which obliges employers to engage in a consultation process and to notify the Minister for Employment Affairs and Social Protection of potential collective redundancies. That Act, which was drafted in Europe before the Advanced Industrial Relations Framework of the Workplace Relations Commission and the Labour Court that we now have, provides no Government Minister with the power to influence a particular outcome or to direct a party to take a particular course of action in respect of a redundancy situation. The Attorney General confirmed that this is even more so uh, the case where there is a High Court appointed liquidator who is in charge rather than the employer. The compliance issues required under the Act of 97 are that a consultation process should be initiated between the employer and the employee's representatives, that specific information should be supplied by the employer to the employee's representatives, and that the Minister for Employment, Affairs and Social Protection should be notified of the proposed collective redundancy. Officials in that department have confirmed that all these requirements were complied with, com complied with in the case of the Debenhams liquidators. One element of the situation is a clear frustration, that is very clear to me anyway, it's a frustration on the part of the workers and their trade union representatives with the liquidators. The deputies will be aware that the appropriate avenue of redress in that respect with officers appointed by the High Court cannot lie with a government minister. In the context of Debenhams Ireland undergoing a court supervised liquidation, I want to emphasise to the House that a company cannot merely ascertain that it is insolvent. A lot of deputies have commented here today and on previous occasions about the issue of assets and transfer of assets and tactical solvents and so on. That's just not as simple as people portray it is in this House, and the courts have a judgment call on that. Uh, officially, it must, be, it must apply for an official court liquidation, and as such, the liquidation will be under the supervision of the Irish court system. It's not the political system that makes that judgment, it's the court system. It is not possible or proper that a third party should seek to change the order of distribution of assets and discharge of debts necessitated by the liquidation, given the statutory framework that we currently have. That is why I continue to call on all parties to enter into discussions and engage towards a fair resolution with a clear right understanding of the financial realities of the company. A lot of deputies draw the, draw the comparison with Duffy Cahill and try to portray that it's as simple as implementing Duff, Duffy Cahill and this wouldn't happen. Duffy Cahill, to be clear, was in a, in a response to the Cleary situation. And a lot of deputies consistently make the connection with Debenhams and theories. And I'm not convinced that you're right to do that, uh, because they're very, very different situations. Uh, and it doesn't, it doesn't mean that it's as simple as us implementing Duffy, Duffy Cahill and the recommendations that are there. While saying that, we are committed to reviewing it and looking at it as well. But members here simply draw that conclusion and think that's the magic wand, because theories, in your view, is the same as Debenhams. That's not proven yet, and that doesn't seem to be the case at all. Uh, as we all know, there was a substantial and valuable property asset on O'Connell Street that was structured as a separate legal entity to that of the, of the, fa uh, the failing retail operations business in relation to theories. The deputies, by uh, intimidate, in, intimidate, making an incorrect comparison between the liquidation of Debenhams, where there's actually no evidence of significant assets still being owned by that company or by a related company, and that of Cleary's department stores, where there was an asset known to exist but shown to be out of reach of the workers for the purpose of redundancy payments. They are very different scenarios, but that's not always portrayed in the, the various debates. The Cleary's workers in the end receive a discretionary goodwill payment from the owners of the property asset, in addition to their state-paid statutory redundancy. But I am unaware of any prospects of a similar payment that could be made in the case of Devonance, and certainly not one that I as Minister can facilitate. Other members have a different view on that, and I am happy to take any information you have in the, into that discussion as well. In the case of Debenhams, there is no reason to believe that the company is in the financial position to pay the workers either the collectively bargained four weeks per year of service, enhanced redundancy package their trade unions achieved in the past, nor at this point, according to reports, does it seem possible for the liquidator to pay them the statutory minimum, minimum amount. And again, if you have evidence that's different to that, we certainly will have a look at that. In terms of the government's role, we will make sure the legal rights of the workers are fully vindicated. That means making sure that they get at least two weeks per year of service, which is a statutory redundancy payment minimum. 
If the liquidator in the company cannot pay that, the Department of Social Protection will pay for it out of the Social Insurance Fund. Officials have been in contact with the liquidators in that respect and are progressing through that. It also falls to the Department to ensure that the workers get whatever welfare payments and income supports they are entitled to. We will make sure that they are given opportunities to retrain, get access to adult education where appropriate and get assistance in seeking new jobs. The job loss protocol has been activated for employees at Debenhams, putting in place all available supports and information for workers. Officials have been facilitating the workers with online information, se information sessions and other forms of assistance in recent weeks. Indeed, workers have, been, have told me that the job loss protocol has been helpful. While it doesn't nastily compensate them for the difficulty they're going through, but it certainly helps them on a journey and a future journey as well back into the retail sector as well. Just it, to finish up, chair, I'll put the rest of my speech on, on, on the record. But just to be clear, we are dealing with the unions around. Uh, future solutions. We are, have committed to doing that quite quickly to review the recommendation, recommendation of Duffy Cahill and other recommendations, other suggestions. I've asked ICT2 for more evidence, more information to pass into me and their legal opinion because it might differ to ours in some cases as well. But we are uh, prepared as a government to review this space and to work on this as well. But it doesn't mean that we can do it just like that. Thank it means you, we have to Minister engage with all the stakeholders to see what can we do here in a positive. And the suggestions here of levies and all that as well. We're, we're, and we are prepared to look at all that, which have committed we're, we're, to it. Way over the clock, well. over time now, please. Deb Deputy Catherine Connolly, please. And Minister, you've expressed sympathy with employees who are out of a job, and you've talked how difficult it is for them. And then you talked about drawing parallels or saying that the Clary situation is the same as this situation. And I would ask you to read the motion, because nowhere have we asked for sympathy. And I want to thank my colleague. Um, John Collins, Deputy Collins, for bringing it. And I want to acknowledge the work to date of Solidarity People Before Profit and also Sinn Féin in raising this matter. But if you read this motion, I see no reference to Clary's. I do see I do, a question or, uh, um, points out the report that was carried out four years and six months ago, which I'm going to come back to. And it's a little bit disingenuous of you, Minister, to talk about us on this side of the house making comparisons or making simplistic comparisons. The question is, the question is for you, Minister, why haven't you acted on the Duffy Cahill report? Four years, six months later. I want to acknowledge the workers who are out today in Galway trying to prevent the one asset that's left, which was valued at something around 20 million, I'm not sure what it's valued at now, in Air Street in Galway. And they've been out for over 162 days, and I proudly stood with them, which was the least I could do. And the least you might do is stand up here today and tell us why Duffy Cahill hasn't been implemented. And let's look at Duffy Cahill. Page 45. The proposals, six proposals, Minister, very modest, very modest proposals. The proposals taken together aim to ensure that employees are treated with dignity. Can you imagine that? Six proposals arising from a report to tell us that employees should be treated with dignity and that if collective and redundancies are to occur, that there is an opportunity for employees to engage and be consulted. Can you imagine something as basic as that? Engage and be consulted. Armed with the leverage of a threat of statutory applications, which I'll come back to, to recover assets. And it goes on to say, if effectively enforced, the proposed increased sanctions for failing to respect the rights of employees would, it is hoped, just hoped, would deter the type of conduct identified. Okay, so let me go back now to the Duffy Cahill report, commissioned in January 16 by two ministers who are still TDs in this hall. Deputy Richard Bruton, who was Minister for Jobs, Enterprise and Innovation, and Minister uh, at the time, Jed Nash, Minister for Business and Enterprise. Jobs, Enterprise and Innovation, Business and Employment. And they, they commissioned the report, and the report was done very quickly, and it came back in March 16, which was very good. The terms of reference were extremely restrictive. But even notwithstanding the restriction of the terms of reference, they came up with six recommendations that I said already are very, very modest. The recommendations are in relation to consultation 
obligation to notify, sanctions for failure to consult, a mechanism for the recovery of assets, uh, the use of an injunction and a mechanism to ensure payments of enhanced redundancy payments. And so they went on. I think they had a twin track approach to look at the existing legislation to see if it could be used better and also to look at amendments of employment legislation. And what jumped out at me, and I'm sure it jumped out at everybody that read it, in relation to the existing legislation, the Companies Act 2014. It needs not amendment, but it needs more use. It's in need of use. It is striking that many of the provisions of the Companies Act, which may be of assistance, are not frequently invoked, such as Section 608, are not invoked at all, such as Section 599, and so on. And they tell us one of the reasons for that are the cost implications, and there's a specific recommendation that the minister might be able to do something there, and a specific recommendation to help him specifically as to what he might do. And you stand here today, and not once have you addressed why there has been a failure to implement those six recommendations. Legislation that already exists, but is underused or not used at all, plus very basic amendments to ensure that employees can be treated with dignity and have a minimum of consultation. And you stand here today and tell us that this is distinctly different from Clary's. And the answer to that is that is not correct. Yes, there was a, a, a sleight of hand, certainly, or more than a sleight of hand, a deliberate action to separate the business into the operations section and, and, and another company so as to avoid having any assets that would have to be shared out with the employees. Yes, that's different than now, but there are many other similarities. And your failure to act on the Duffy Cahill report is just not acceptable. So I've asked before for plain and simple language. Please tell us why you haven't acted on it and when you're going to act on it. That's, that's very simple. Are we just going to shred it, throw it in the bin and start all over again? Please, if that's the answer, let's do that. But let's stop all this double talk and double language because the least that the Debenham workers deserve after 162 days of standing in all sorts of weather, faced to rest by the Garda Siakona for simply drawing attention to their plight, the least that they deserve from us is a certain measure of honesty. None of us ascribe to be, aspire to being saints, but at least plain language that we all understand that's the least they deserve. And when we look at the if the Duffy Cahill report had been implemented, there would have been a, a, a statutory entitlement to a 30-day consultation. There would have been access to various statutory measures if it had been implemented, without a doubt. And there would have been a better enforcement of the enhanced redundancy payments at a minimum. And then if we look at the sector that we're talking about, we see that the Debenham protesters are mostly women. We see that the Oireachtas um, Library and Research Report, they wrote a very interesting article entitled Anticipating the Gendered Impacts of COVID-19. And they found that women disp disproportionately make up sectors such as retail and hospitality that were entirely shut down due to COVID and therefore more likely to lose earnings. A study by the Fiscal Institute showed at the time of the lockdown, 17% of female employees were in a sector that is now shut down in comparison to 13% of male employees and the same position across Europe. A research by McKinsey showed that women's jobs are 1.8 times more vulnerable to COVID crisis than men because of existing gender inequalities. And a report from the research from the ESRI and so on in relation to the gender, the pay gap. The burden of this unpaid work has become more pronounced during the pandemic, negatively impacting many women's ability to work from home and deepening existing economic inequalities. According to the European Institute for Gender Equality, women make up 82% of all cashiers in the EU. The two high profile cases that we're talking about, and there are many others, to which Clary's and Debenham's to which the Duffy Cahill report is particularly relevant, relate to the retail sector, which we know, in which more women 
substantially more women are employed than men. Now, I don't ask for any different treatment for men and women, but it's important to realise the gender imbalance, and it's important to realise how women have suffered disproportionately as a result of various governments' failure to bring in proper legislation to protect all employees' rights, but particularly women. I'm now going to finish up in relation to the interesting and coincidental, it would seem, involvement, well, coincidental is wrong, let me put this differently, in relation to the loan and the indebtedness of Debenhams in England and the Irish uh, retail outlet was used so that, as a co-guarantor of that indebtedness. That in itself begs questions. And then let's look who, who, who are the entities that trigger that insolvency. Well, we have our own bank, Bank of Ireland, which we partly own. And of course, we have Barclays and we have hedge funds from America triggering the insolvency pro uh, process. And one has to ask, how did Debenhams Ireland be used as a co-guarantor in relation to loans in England with all that ensued from that? I'm raising that. I'm simply raising it for, for, for you to look at. I'll finish up in my last 15 seconds by asking you to read the motion. And when you're given your conclude, concluding few words, please tell us why it hasn't been implemented and if you're going to shred it. You're in Mila Mark at the Ken Corley. And Chuck the Louise O'Reilly. Um, Minister, I'm looking at a letter here that was sent to you uh, from Patricia King, uh, stated the 31st of August. It's addressed to yourself, Minister of State for Business, Employment and Retail, Department of Employment and Enterprise. So actually, and we so terribly lucky that we would have had two ministers to choose from. And I fully respect that the schedule was changed, but neither minister now, neither senior minister is available. Um, and that, that sends a very clear message to, uh, to workers, to the Debenhams workers in particular. And I don't mean that disrespectful to yourself, and I'm sure you won't take it like that. But it is very, very instructive of the attitude that this government has to workers and to workers' rights that the senior minister, when it could have been either of them, could have been either minister, could have turned up and not one of them could make themselves available. Now, we're all busy, and sometimes, you know, politics as in life, it's about priorities. And they have not prioritised the Debenhams workers. I looked at your legislation programme. It doesn't prioritise workers' rights. There's nothing, nothing in it, nothing uh, to prevent tactical insolvencies, nothing about a statutory pay, uh, pay scheme, and we're in the middle of a global pandemic, nothing about strengthening workers' rights to organise, nothing about uh, making COVID-19 a notifiable disease, nothing at all, actually, that would speak uh, to workers, except the absence speaks volumes. They see it, they know it. They know exactly what's going on. It's exactly the same as when uh, the man who is now the tarnished was running for the leadership of your party and he tried to, uh, to go on the platform of implementing a good old-fashioned Thatcherite strike ban, which is exactly what it was. Now, that might appeal to your base, but I'm telling you now, that does not go down well with workers at all. They see you and they know the attitude that you have. On the 15th of June, your programme for government was published. It says in it, review whether the legal provisions surrounding collective redundancies and liquidations of companies effectively protect the rights of workers. That was 93 days ago. I just saw a tweet from Mandate, the trade union uh, outline in this. So you've had 93 days. So you might use your concluding remarks just to advise us at exactly what stage that review is. Now, I could save you uh, a lot of trouble. And I could save your, uh, your departmental staff an awful lot of trouble and indeed the, uh, the two responsible ministers a lot of headaches. Uh, they don't protect the rights of workers. The legal provisions now don't protect the, likes, uh, the rights of workers. The mandate workers wouldn't be in dispute if the legal provisions existed to protect their rights and to protect their collective agreement. They are on the streets because the legal, provision don't, the legal provisions don't exist. Patricia King is writing to you because the legal provisions don't exist. The General Secretary of Mandate is writing to you because the legal provisions don't exist. So that's your review done. You've had 93 days Nothing has been done on this. Nothing has been done that is of any use to those workers. And I want to pay tribute to them. Of course I do. I have stood with them. I have nothing but admiration for their determination. But at the end of this, and let's not lose sight of this, Minister, because this is really important. 
They are fighting for a redundancy claim. What is at the end of this for them is no job. They will be jobless. They will be unemployed. As we head into a period of sustained high unemployment, these men and women who have given decades of service to their employer, decades of loyal service under a collective agreement, which as anyone would know, and, and I've negotiated plenty of them, always involve a bit of give and take. So they would have had, around the negotiating table, they would have had a give and they would have had something that they wanted from the, the employer. That goes into the collective agreement and the employer walks away. The government says, oh, that's grand. We can't do anything about it. And when the opposition raise, uh, raise this in the doll, they say, well, it's not, that, uh, it's not that simple. It's actually quite complicated. But you've had 93 days from when you put it in your programme to, to, for government to actually actually get it done and nothing has been done for them. They hear the message very, very clearly. They're sick of the tea and sympathy. They want some action. Now, the General Secretary of Congress has written to you. She has outlined what she believes is a solution. It's echoed in the, uh, the motion, and I want to commend the deputies for bringing the motion here today. So the, the question is actually a very, very simple one. Much and all, as I wish, uh, I know you wish it was complicated. It's a very, very simple one. What have you done for the last 93 days in terms of bringing this review in it? You know, show us where the protections are. Because if the protections exist, those workers will want to see them. They want to, to invoke those protections. It is, in fact, very, very simple. It's about which side you're on. It's about who you come in here to protect. It's about what you prioritise. And, Minister, the Debenhams workers and every other worker in this state sees very clearly whose side you are on, sees very clearly who you come in here to protect. But we will not stand for that, and they will not stand for that. The time is right now for action on this. You can't say, I'll work with you over the coming months. That's not fair. Go on, Michael. Deputy Quinnivan. Um, Minister, on Monday in my constituency, I met with the Debenham workers. I've met them on a number of occasions. They're a fantastic group of people. They remain strong. They're unbowed. They're unbroken. And if anybody thinks they're, they're, they, they'll wait this out and expect them to give up their protests, that's not going to happen. They're very, very much mistaken. Their passion and commitment to their cause is as strong now as it was in April when Debenhams, using the cover of COVID, closed down the shops across the state. It's 160 days today, Minister. Minister remarks the start of the picket that they done outside the offices, outside the shops. They done that, Minister, as you're well aware, to make sure that the assets weren't taken out of them and that they could keep some chance of getting some sort of redundancy, some sort of fair redundancy that they're entitled to. They've worked for decades, as, as, my dep as Deputy already said, many of them for a number of decades. I met one guy in Limerick who worked for 40 years in, in the company um, to end up outside their own stores people who never thought they would be doing that. And, and I think to remember as well is when this is over, even if they get what they're looking for, their job is gone. They were offered nothing by the company. The workers, Sinn Féin and other opposition members have lobbied the government for changes to legislation since April and in previous stalls. I spoke myself on this on a number of occasions in the previous stall to other ministers where we were told that the Duffy Cattle report would be reviewed, would be looked at, would be implemented. Um, I got the letter from Mick too as well. Um, there is no legislation there to protect the workers. It doesn't exist. You can save yourself, as, as Deputy already said, you can save yourself the going through all the reviews or whatever because it just doesn't exist. It's just simply not there. I want to raise one specific, specific issue that was raised to me by a, a, a striker on Monday and it's about the online sales. Um, I was contacted by a postal worker who claimed that a number of packages being sent via the post from Debenham's online stores remains very strong and consistent. The packages continue to flow into Ireland without interruption, while the workers are picketing through rail, rain, hail and sunshine to get their just settlements. Minister, that's simply not, it's not acceptable, it's not fair. The Taoiseach met with some of the workers recently and by all accounts he had some very nice words to say to them. But can he follow up this lip service now by supporting these motions and ensuring that the recommendations of the Duffy Cattle report are implemented? The time for platitudes and kind words has passed. They've had they've passed 160 times now. Action is needed as these workers are going to campaign for another 160 days. It's simply not fair. Being no doubt about it, they're not going away if these workers don't have the, get what they're entitled to. Thank you, Deputy Quinnivan. Um, Deputy Farrell. So, 
at 6.30 a.m. this morning, workers of Debenhams in my home city of Galway started their picket outside their former employer. They have waited, they have protested, and they have engaged for 161 days for, an exit for just exit package. And they continue to stand outside the Debenhams stores as we debate this to demand basic respect from an employer that they gave so many years to. They feel abandoned and they have absolutely been abandoned. They have been abandoned by an employer that they gave years of service to and they have been abandoned by this government. And before the government says that how were we to know, well we all knew, we saw that ha what happened to the Cleary's workers, we have the recommendations from the Duffy Cahill report, this was released a number of years ago, this needs to be implemented now. The time for hemming and hawing is long over, these workers are in a crisis right at this moment, we need to do this to protect them as well as many other workers who may face this exact same situation. It has happened before, it is happening now and we sure as hell cannot let this happen again. We need legislation to protect workers and we need this urgently. This is not an opposition idea, this is an idea coming directly from the workers. They are not picketing for the sake of picketing, they are workers who are, have been forced to stand out on the picket line to fight for justice, a justice that we must ensure is delivered. This is one of the many failings we continue to have in this state in relation to workers' rights and it is high time that we have protection in place for workers. 100 140 jobs were lost in Galway. Some of these people have given over 30 years plus service. Collectively, these workers have over 300 years of service given to this co company. For over the past few months, uh, I've got to know many of the women who are maintaining a vigil at the Tralee Debenham store over the past 160 odd days. While I accept that Taunish isn't here today, they're upset with him. They disagree with his comments that this is not a tactical redundancy. They disagree with his insistence on, the, on differentiating between the Cleary situation and theirs. They fought successfully and insisted that the 20 million worth of stock belongs to the Irish company. They are being denied, continue to be denied, a fair and just settlement. This government amendment of excuses but short on ideas. What talks have taken place? What efforts have the government made to discuss with Debenhams and ensure a just and fair settlement for them? Legislation is required, if not for these workers, but to protect workers in the future and prevent this reoccurring. Two reviews and an examination is not enough. These women, Trish, Geraldine, Amy, all the other workers in Tralee and the thousand workers around the country deserve better. Margaret. Time on week, the Chakta Dialogue, John Collins, Mariala, and PMB show. Over five months ago, more than 1,000 Debenhams workers in 11 stores across the Republic were told that the company was going into liquidation and that they were going to lose their jobs. Rather than set aside funds to pay the workers a proper redundancy package, the company instead transferred assets to the UK parent company and tried to claim the stock held in Irish stores as British stock. The treatment of its loyal and dedicated workforce was nothing short of scandalous, particularly as many gave valuable service over two decades to the company. The workers did not take the shoddy treatment sitting down and have stood up for their rights and are fighting back to claim what is rightly theirs and for justice. What the Debenhams workers are asking for is not unreasonable. They just want the proper redundancy package to be put in place. The disposal of the stock worth approximately 23 million and held in Irish stores should be ring-fenced to fund the workers' redundancy package. Additionally, what they want and what everyone with the workers' interests at heart would want is the implementation of the Duffy Cahill recommendations from 2016. The report compiled after the Cleary scandal has lain virtually dormant since then. Clearly, this government wants to protect big business. This new government could have included in its programme for government a commitment to address the issues of companies transferring 
assets from one business to another in order to avoid their responsibilities to their workers. After all, Micheál Martin was appointed Taoiseach on June the 27th, so members of the new government would have been fully aware of the issues and the demands of the Debenham workers when the government was formed. The new government did say they would hold a review into the issues around collective redundancies and the liquidation of companies. However, we already have a report that says everything that needs to be said about such matters. That review held four years ago and resulted in the Duffy Cahill report. So we don't need another report or a time-wasting review. All the workers want at this time is for the Debenhams management to abide by their own collective agreement over redundancies. The way the Debenham workers have been treated should never have been allowed to happen. It is the responsibility of this government to make sure that it will never happen to the workers in the future. It is not too late for this government to act to ensure that the Debenham workers get justice. Thank you. Deputy Pat Buckley. Well, I want to commend the deputies for bringing this uh, PNB tonight. A lot of stuff has been covered, uh, Minister. Minister, we were in here uh, earlier on today talking about taxi drivers, and a lot of these Debenham workers, their partners, husbands and wives are taxi drivers, so um, they won't be rushing down to the bank for taking out loans for going on holidays when you lift restrictions. It's been mentioned on the Duffy Cal report, but what I want to say here is when there was emergencies here in this country, uh, particularly with the bank bailouts, government were fast enough to you know, introduce emergency legislation and whatever. We're talking about real lives and real people here. Um, I mean, what I can figure out here is the Debenham workers have been left down. You go to work, you give a service, you expect, when you give goodness, you expect goodness back. Basically, this company has crapped up now, and that's as polite as I can be. I've been dealing with them in my offices, so have my other two fellow Cork TDs been dealing with in their offices, and the families here are broken. And this isn't just, you know, your city-wise where the basis of the, the Debenhams are actually placed. The community is sparse and it's well spread out, these people, and they're absolutely broken. We have a T-shirt from Cork at the moment, and everybody is praising him from Cork. He can't even look after his own below in Cork at the moment. I mean, what we're appealing here is, sometimes we can come in here, Minister, we can score political points, right? We can throw insults, whatever across the floor. This is about... What we should be doing here is punishing the people that are crapping on our own. Right? These are our own people, our own citizens, working paying tax, putting into this exchequer, and what are we doing? We give them a pat in the back, and a pat in the back is a foot and a half from a kick in the backside. That's what I was always told. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't wear well with people when they can't put food on the table. They're stressed out of their head. We have problems at the moment with uh, public transport and schools transport. Now, I don't mind people that can't get to work and have a family and trying to get them to school. You have taxi services that are probably tied to this. Nothing is working for them. All they want is fairness. All they want is respect. And actually, even if they stood up and had a fight with the Debenhams and liquidators and said, no, we're not taking this. You know, this is our country. These are our rules. These are our people. And we're going to stand up for them first. I think some bit of credit might have been garnered in this. But at present, I feel, you know, it, it's so disheartening to come in here 160 days later. We have Debenham workers in Cork today on 12-hour fast. You know, it's, it's, it's getting serious. And I mean, all I'm appealing to you here is to support the PNB, support the people in Debenhams, give them the respect that they should have garnered when they got up early every morning to go to work, to rent a few bob, to send the gag to school, to pay for their mortgage, pay for their car, whatever it was, and all of a sudden that is taken away and all we have is an excuse is, sure we can't do that. Sure we can't do that. But we are supposed to be the legislators. We are supposed to be the gang inside in this house that write the rules. And surely, I mean, if, you know, we have, how many times have I come in here and said, how many times have I come in here and said, we are here today trying to fix something that's not broke. Well, we should be in here today because the system is broken. We should be putting, putting it right. And I think if you look at the social impact of this, the mental impact of this, the anguish, the bravery of the workers and the staff and, the, and their families for supporting them, I mean, has to be commended. But to be genuinely, if even there's anything, anything at all you can actually do to say, look, we'll do the right thing, we'll stand by you, and we'll stand by our own people. That's what should be done. Thank you, Ken Corla. Martin Brown. Your Mr. Martin Corla. Uh, I want to congratulate Deputy Joan Collins for bringing forward the motion. 
And look at today's motions about justice and fairness for those who have, through no fault of their own, been impacted due to the current COVID-19 crisis. When any business minister shuts down, it's the workers' families who suffer. But the reasons why these businesses close their doors are varied, and there are questions over the purposes behind the closure of Debenhams. There's a history of this type of action that impacts workers the most. For some, a workforce may be just entries on a spreadsheet. They're just numbers to move around the screen until they fit with the desired profit margin of the company concerned. Unfortunately, there seems to be the case with the matter we are discussing today. We've seen it with Talk Talk, Clearies, and a number of others in recent times. There seems to be an ongoing failure, failure of the authorities to address the ability of large companies to exploit loopholes at the expense of the average person. But it is always the worker who suffers. <clears throat> we now have workers who remain in a precarious situation while Debenhams exploit this system, claim stock from higher stores as their own, and attempt to leave the workers with nothing other than statutory entitlements, which they have come from the state's purses. This is also despite the collective agreement reached by the mandate union with Debenhams that stated that if they were made redundant, they would receive four weeks' pay per year of service. The Taoiseach himself, Minister, recently spoke some fine words about that contemptible way in which the workers were treated. But that is, where, that is as far as he went, just another soundbite from our Taoiseach. The government has stood by while workers demonstrate on the streets for their entitlements to be realised and for some notice to be taken by those in power. And that, as Deputy said before me, that's us here. Unfortunately, that was not forthcoming, and we find ourselves here today supporting a motion quite rightly tabled by its solidarity people for profit. Sinn Féin has given the workers a staunch support as well throughout this process, and as such, we will be supporting this motion, which seeks, among other measures, to demand that the state forego its priority as a creditor and for the liquidator to use those funds to pay the enhanced redundancy payments agreed between Debenhams workers and the company. It also seeks to ensure that where agreements for enhanced redundancies have been negotiated with workers, those are honoured <coughs> as preferential creditors in any subsequent liquidation process. This motion calls for a fundamental change how companies are allowed to operate in ways that leave their workers high and dry. I and my colleagues in Sinn Féin will be supporting this motion. However, it is outrageous that we are in a situation in which members of this House are left with no alternative but to table a motion because those who could change the system choose not to do so. And that, Minister, is ye across there in the government benches. Garmila Margaret. Thank you very much. Uh, now, Deputy Eleanor Reardon. Margaret Ken Corley. And um, just to congratulate Deputy Joan Collins uh, and the independent group on bringing forward this motion. There's quite a number of motions have come uh, in front of this House in relation to. Uh, workers' rights, and it is unfortunately, uh, a Minister, and I, I, this is no disrespect to yourself, but it is a common theme of these uh, debates, these motions, that the senior minister isn't in attendance. Uh, and you may consider that to be a political jibe and an unfair political criticism, but it is the truth. Because the last time uh, we had a motion of this nature, uh, the, the very same comments were made a number of months ago, uh, and it was reported upon. And the, 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 the issue is be it Minister Humphreys or, or, or Tawnister of Radker, is that that does give, as has been quite rightly indicated by Deputy Barry, uh, a sense from those who are deeply affected by these issues that the, the Cabinet is absent from their thought process, or the workers are, are absent from the Cabinet's thought uh, process. Um, so my frustration, I suppose, is uh, is that we seem to go from in industrial dispute to industrial dispute to industrial dispute to deal with the individual issues that are affecting that individual case and not look at the entirety of the industrial relations architecture uh, of the state, which clearly is deficient. We brought forward legislation in order to deal with this situation, myself and Deputy Jed Nash, and it was dismissed by uh, Tonshta uh, Varadkar as virtue signalling, which was a remarkable statement for the Tawnish to say uh, when you know we uh, we try to be as constructive as possible we try not to do um, personalized political jibing we try to be constructive it's a legislative body we come here and we try to propose legislation um, Deputy Nash is somebody who has already been alluded to was the one who who commissioned the Duffy Cattle report he's somebody who knows this area intimately he, he brought forward legislation which is the appropriate thing to do uh, rather than to, uh, you know, to engage in any other uh, type of, uh, of uh, political activity. 
uh, and what we, uh, our, our reasoned uh, contribution uh, was dismissed as virtue signaling by somebody who has done nothing. Now, it's not good enough for the Times to also to say that the Duffy Caha report wouldn't, wouldn't deal with the Debenham situation. I mean, we might be willing to argue that over and back if the recommendations of Duffy Caha had actually been implemented to the letter and then were found to be uh, deficient. We might be able to debate that over and back. But the fact that the Duffy Caha report, as has been stated, has been sitting somewhere in, in government since March 2016, which I might, to give my own uh, uh, party uh, a, a level of credit, I don't think would have happened if the Labour Party were still uh, in government. I, I feel that it would have been given an awful lot more, uh, uh, a huge amount more weight would have been given to the importance of the issue. But it's stuck on a, on a, on a shelf somewhere, not taken uh, seriously by government, and certainly not seriously taken uh, by, uh, by Tonjda Vragger, who does have a history of, um, of watering down rhetoric around the rights of workers and did stand on a platform in order to become Fine Gael leader and Taoiseach at the time saying that essential workers uh, should have restricted access uh, to a collective bargaining rights uh, and, uh, and to, strike, uh, to, to the right to strike. It's in black and white in, in, in his literature, which again, as others have said, it's all very well to, to applaud these workers, these essential workers when they come to the countries. Uh, aid in a time of, uh, of national crisis. But that was the instinct, that was his instinct, is that collective bargaining rights, strike rights, are secondary to the great national endeavour which he feels so strongly about. So my point to you is this, uh, Minister. Um, it's, it's about where people feel. Uh, is government at their back? Does government have their back? Does the legislature here, legislature here have their back or not? Is, it, is industrial relations here in Ireland about um, you know, conflict after conflict after conflict, or is it something about having protections from within this body? Now, we would submit to you and suggest to you, and it's been said about the industrial relations architecture of this state, and I'm glad I don't play golf. In fact, <laughs> recent experiences has, uh, has taught me that I should never take up golf. But it's been described that, that the, uh, the industrial relations architecture of this state is like a golf club that you, just, you can become a member, but you can't play. So you can join the golf club, but you can't play golf. So the employer has a veto. And it's a, it, it, we, we have probably have some of the, the weakest, regardless of, of efforts of many people in government and, and outside government who have put down pieces of legislation and, and tried to lobby in this area. We have probably some of the weakest uh, uh, industrial relations, collective bargaining uh, legislation in Europe because the employer has a veto. There is no requirement uh, on uh, an employer to engage uh, with, um, uh, with a representative body which represents workers. And this is an economy, by the way, which has 23% before COVID, 23% of Irish workers were in statistical low pay. 23% of Irish workers, one of the highest rates of low pay employment in the OECD. And 40% of young people under 30 are in insecure work. So on both of those statistics, these things only happen in economies which have, which have weak um, industrial relations uh, legislation, weak um, collective bargaining legislation. Now, what has happened before when pieces of legislation have been brought to the Shand or, 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 or the Dáil, uh, the AG has been, has been, you know, has facilitated government by saying, well, this is anti-constitutional. What we would say in the Labour Party is that maybe it's time to challenge that, and maybe it's actually time to have, to, to strengthen our constitution by means of a constitutional amendment to enshrine workers' rights within the constitution. So no longer do we have the fallback position from government to say, well, look, we'd love to help you. I mean, we really care deeply about, you know, this case, this case, this case, this case, this case. But the AG says that it's unconstitutional, so what can we do? Well, look, if we can, if we can take on some of the thorniest, most difficult, most divisive issues in Irish society, bring them to the, to the people, and have them resolved by means of a referendum, then why can't we do it in terms of workers' rights? And if it means that we have to require of, a, of an employer to engage with the representative body of the worker, well, then let's do it because then we won't have an economy which is underpinned by low pay. 
Like, I'm quite sure it's an insult to anybody's sense of morality or decency, no matter what their background or, or where they live or what their income bracket is, that this economy has been uh, propped up by low pay, low pay work, 23%. And has been said uh, before by, uh, by Deputy Connolly, uh, I, I believe, uh, disproportionately uh, women. And of course, disproportionately migrant workers and disproportionately uh, young people. So what I would say to you, uh, Minister, is that can, can you just uh, relate to, to Minister Vracker to stop with the jibes, to engage with the responsibility that he does have, to implement the Duffy, Duffy Caha report, and to maybe investigate the entire infrastructure through which we are operating. What is he so afraid of? What is the government so afraid of in order to, to even up uh, that imbalance that we have? Because if it does take a constitutional referendum, I'm quite sure that deputies around this house would support such a referendum. And you know something, I'm quite sure the people of Ireland would support such a referendum. Now, it may take 18 months, it may take two years. But I believe, I believe that if we did have that situation, we wouldn't have deputies workers who have been courageously fighting for so long and inspiring so many people across the country with their, with, with their, with their battle. And we wouldn't have poverty pay and insecure work <laughs> and the level of unemployment obviously that's been caused by COVID, which is directionally, uh, directly uh, connected uh, with the, the, the way that, that, that our economy has been constructed. Thank you, Deputy. Uh, thank you, Gary um, I want to thank the Deputy Collins and the Independence Group for bringing this motion forward today. I think it's a very appropriate motion. It's very apt. It's five paragraphs long, and within those five paragraphs there's a very clear roadmap for how we can make better the lives of workers throughout this country who are experiencing an anxiety that is being um, accelerated by the fact that there doesn't seem to be the fact, it doesn't seem to be a sense that the government have their back. And both ministers present here this evening, and I believe this is our fourth time, is it, where in, over the last couple of months, where we've got together and somebody, one of somebody from the opposition has brought forward a motion in relation to workers' rights and we've had many of the same conversations that we're having now. Four occasions since June. We don't do that to be a nuisance. We don't do that because we want to get on your nerves. The reason why there's been four motions, three of which pertain specifically to Debenhams since June, is because there is a genuine absence in the law of protections for workers. And what we are encouraging, trying our best to keep on the record of this house where we create laws is that within that absence people's lives have been impacted detrimentally and we can through the mechanisms at our disposal in this house make them better that's all we're asking and i do believe we can change that um i want to because i think it's incredibly important that we do i want to acknowledge once again the role played by the workers of Debenhams in the 11 stores across the country who have been, through their courage, through their determination, have been incredibly inspiring. They've inspired me and I'm sure they've inspired other workers who may be feeling a sense of insecurity in their own positions. That is imperative that we fight back and we hold power to account, we hold vested interest into account and through our collaborative efforts try to make things a little bit better. I want to imagine, the reason why I think it's absolutely essential that we make this better, I want to imagine what air high streets and air, high streets, I don't even like the term, but if you imagine Henry Street where I have the pleasure of representing, 100 yards up the road from the Debenham store, which is now lying empty, is Clearly's, which is now going to be something very different. And within those 100 yards on that street, there is probably, I think, about five or six relatively large high street stores which are at risk of closing down. And as they close down, they're going to vacate their city. The workers in them who have predominantly been low paid, but have, through their efforts, made them relevant, are going to find themselves in very precarious circumstances. And that's all ahead of us. And what I would strongly argue, and have done for actually several years now, even in my role as a Dublin City Councillor, is that the trends that we're seeing now have been accelerated by COVID. But they weren't necessarily the cause of it. What you're seeing on high streets, what you're seeing in Debenhams, over the last couple of years in Dublin, I can speak of Dublin City because that's what I know best. In Dublin City, we've seen a loss of commercial footfall. We've seen the M50 shopping centres and shopping centres on the motorway taking most of the footfall out of the city. We've seen the emergence of online and retail and online shopping, which is taking people once again out of our high streets. And stores recognise that. 
And what they've used is these tactical insolvencies to remove themselves from the responsibility in, for, in terms of paying redundancy, in terms of living up to the entitlements that they should have for their um, workers who create these stores. They're using these tactical insolvencies and the existence that we have now under a pandemic to accelerate a reality that they knew was going to happen. And if we don't step in, if we don't reimagine how we can protect our workers, reimagine how we can rejuvenate those streets that are just not commercially focused, we're going to have, ten, we're going to have cities all over the country that are just lying bare. And the people that built them up have been left behind. I think that's absolutely essential. I want, to talk, so I want to talk about the Duffy Cattle Report, which features heavily in the motion. I had to reread the Duffy Cattle Report today. Um, I've been told reading of it since I was elected in... February and probably the fourth since it was emerged in 2016. I'm reading this document. It's a very moderate document. It's actually quite conservative in its approach. I was expecting, such as a fear that I've seen Fine Gael having, I was expecting something like Mao's Little Red Book to be in there. But it actually isn't. It's quite a conservative document that has a number of recommendations that are actually very moderate in its approach. And it's, Minister, I disagree with you entirely that the Duffy Cattle Report was commissioned solely on the basis of what happens in Clearly's. Clearly, Clearly's was an impetus for it, but I mean, we had Vita Cortex before that, we had the Paris Bakery, um, we had any number, of, any number of instances that were happening when workers were being left behind and their statutory rights were not being protected by the state. And within the Duffy Cattle Report, I have to ask, where, how are we prioritising? We're a report like that, which is so moderate in terms of its approach, um, is simply not being enacted four years afterwards. Minister, you told me that we can get together and we can have a, in your opening statement, you said we can get together and we can talk about it. It's already been, it's been 93 days since this was first brought to the attention of the doll. I mean, when you say we can get together, is that just a way of fobbing us off? I mean, do you have a date in mind? Is that next week? Is it the week after? When can we all get around the table and discuss the implications of that? Because anything else is simply just fobbing us off and it's, it's not really acceptable. The amendment, the five paragraphs that were presented by the independent group are very reasonable. The amendment that was brought forward is a lot longer and actually says nothing and is quite insulting. I think in terms of how we collaborate, there are many instances where we're going to disagree across opposition and government. This shouldn't be one of them. I think across the opposition, across the government, be it the Taoiseach, the Tarnish, the, everyone who else was out standing with the workers, talking about how we'd like to collaborate to make better their lawyers. And yet, we, this is the third occasion a motion has been brought forward from opposition and it's simply just been, with a stroke of a pen, it's been removed out. I mean, I'm not sure, I can, did anyone even have a conversation with the proponents of the motion? Did he sit down and actually say, well, we don't agree with this part, but maybe we can collaborate and we can bring in this aspect of it? Or was it just a case of, nope, bring forward a lot of ridiculous nonsense here that actually means nothing? Because let's just be truthful, what this town announced is nothing. There is a language in it that's actually quite dismissive. Um, even in talking about the... There was a part, the only asset report to be in consideration is some stock in the stars. Some stock in the stars. Some stock in the stars amounts to 25 million. It also amounts to the reasons and the only access, recourse access, where employers, Devon and workers, are literally sleeping outside those stars at the moment, trying to ensure that that stock cannot be taken out because it's the only access to potential justice you have. That's not some stock, that's quite valuable. It's really valuable in terms of the rights that those workers have at the minute, and it's valuable in terms of what they can be afforded in terms of an asset. The what we are, what we will, and the emotions will continue to come down. What we're actually doing here fundamentally is about the role and the protections we employ workers in this city, in this country, and the value we place on their trade unions and trade union representatives. Because it cannot go and said again that this was an agreement between a trade an agreement between its trade union was reached on four weeks redundancy, and it's just been dismissed. And what do the workers have? Absolutely nothing. Absolutely nothing other than to sleep outside stars in a manner that, I mean, it's incredibly courageous, but they shouldn't have to do it. I think one of the most lamentable sights we will see from this pandemic period is working class women being led into police stations. That is a sickening sight, and everyone in this house owes those women an apology. And all they're asking for is four weeks entitlement. They're going, they won't have a job after this, despite the fact that they've filled it up. I mean, Christmas time, they would have been working hard to ensure that when we're in the stores, we are looked after. And seeing them being led into police stations is beyond lamentable. And the fact that we're still saying that we can't do anything, that tough look, effectively tough look, is a disservice. 
and it undermines the role of this House in terms of writing legislation and enacting laws that reflect the type of country that we want to live in. Because if we really valued those workers, and not just through the mealy-mouthed words, if we really valued them, we'd be sitting around the table talking about the type of laws that we can enact that can make better their lives at this moment Thank in time. You, the Duffy Cattle Report is definitely a start in that regard. Thank you. Now we move to solidarity, people before profit, Deputy Boyd Barrett. Deputy Barry and Deputy Murphy, four, two and two. Uh, I won't rehearse the absolutely despicable treatment uh, of Debenhams workers, of more than a thousand Debenhams workers at the hands of Debenhams. That those have been well uh, rehearsed here, and I sorry I should thank the independent group for bringing this motion forward. Uh, we also had our own motion uh, before the summer break, where I think all agree that what Debenhams have done to the workers is absolutely shocking. Um, but what we need to discuss here is the unwillingness of the government to do anything to rectify uh, that injustice. And uh, this counter motion by the government really is just an insult. And it's, it's uh, using technicalities uh, and jargon to hide from your responsibilities. And I'll cut a long story short. See, I think the reason you didn't, uh, and previous governments, did not do anything to legislate for Duffy Cal and to close down the sort of loopholes that allow Debenhams to treat workers in this despicable way is because, in fact, company law is designed in such a way as to make it attractive for companies who precisely want to behave in this way. And indeed, it is even linked uh, to the way in which those same companies avoid paying tax. Because it's all about subsidiaries, hiding assets, uh, hiding profits, uh, in order that they don't have to pay tax and that they have no obligations to workers. That's how the things are set up in this country. And your government and successive governments don't want to do anything about it because, in fact, I think effectively the IDA go off to around the world and tell companies, come to Ireland, you can get away with murder. You can get away with murder on tax and you can get away with murder in how you treat the workers. That's, the, that's cutting a long story short is what's going on. And then you hide behind nonsense. Uh, the, you know, the claim, this isn't the same as Cleary's. Well, it's not exactly the same as Cleary's, but there is a very uh, similar uh, point in that Cleary's also tried to hide the assets it had. Uh, it had a trading company and then it had a property company, right? Uh, so it used the same technique as Debenhams are using here. Uh, setting up, taking over bits of the assets of the company uh, and giving them to other uh, businesses, even though the real activity is here. Okay? So when you say they only have small bits of assets or whatever the phrase is, as has been said, there's about 25 million euro of assets to start off with. That's not small. It would cost about 10 million euro to give the workers the two plus two uh, that they deserve. Uh, and then you could go after those 25 million of assets. Uh, it is not true that you can't do anything because the liquidator told us. The liquidator offered them an insulting million, but the fact that they could offer them a million proves that they can do it. And if they can offer them a million, they can offer them 10 against uh, the assets. And let's not forget that we know in 2018 the online trading company, all that business done here, made about 30 million euro, uh, and the estimated figure at the moment is about 40 million euro. There's plenty of assets to go on. If you're willing to do something about the accountancy tricks these people operate uh, in order to, to hide their assets and then uh, dump workers on the scrap heap. So revenue could do that. And let's not just forget a very important point, Count Corlett, that the workers pointed out. They have paid multiples of the 10 million they're looking for uh, for justice in tax over the 10, 20 or 30 years that they have been working to revenue. So they deserve some support from the government now, and you should step in, give them the two plus two, and then chase the assets, which we know are there, of Debenhams. The Irish Congress of Trade Unions and the Mandate Trade Union recently made a proposal to government. It was a proposal which had the potential to resolve the five-month-long Debenhams dispute. What was the gist of it? Number one, increase employer social insurance contributions. Number two, make a pool of money available to the state and from that enhanced redundancy agreements 
could be uh, honoured in cases of liquidation. It was suggested that were this to be agreed in principle, that an advance payment of 10 million could be made from such a fund to meet the Debenham workers' demand of two plus two, in other words, four weeks per year of service. Yesterday afternoon in the Dáil, the Taoiseach himself poured cold water all over that proposal as a way of resolving the Debenhams dispute. And now today in the Dáil, the Minister in effect does the same thing by putting down an, an amendment which tears the guts out of Deputy Collins's uh, motion and which says retrospective application of future legislation is, quote, highly problematic. Pouring cold water over the proposal and then adding insult to in injury by ensuring that the senior ministers involved here, that neither one of them came into the House to debate this issue. Two conclusions flow from this. Number one, the government are part of the problem here. They are an obstacle to achieving a just settlement. And number two, the workers now have no option, no option but to escalate. I'm confident that they will act and act appropriately. And I strongly appeal to both the Mandate Trade Union and the Irish Congress of Trade Unions to respond to the government's double rebuff by now taking the gloves off and putting in place strong, strong action in support of the Debenham struggle. I listened to Honester Leo Varadkar the other day on RTE Radio about Debenham's workers. And uh, during the interview, he basically acted as, as an attorney or a lobbyist for Debenham's. Uh, he made excuses for Debenham's. In particular, he said, which outraged the workers, that it's not like Cleary's because there's no assets, ignoring, as has been pointed out, in particular, the 25 million euros in stock in uh, the Irish shops. But also, he was talking about it in the context of Britain and Ireland and ignoring the close to 100 million in bank accounts in uh, the UK. And I thought to myself, this encapsulates the difference between Fianna Fáil and Fianna Gael. Because Michal Martin, every time he's asked, he has a particular form of words, he says the workers have been very shoddily treated, very bad, expresses his sympathy with the workers, says it's terrible what Debenhams has done. Leo Varadkar, no sympathy for the workers, advocates for Debenhams. But that's, that's as much as the difference is, because the bottom line is that neither of them do anything to support the workers and to force Debenhams to pay up. And that's encapsulated in the government's amendment. The same line dismissing the existence of assets, of Debenhams, and now even walking away. Like the, the, the impression that Micheál Martin, the Taoiseach, would have given you over the past number of months is, you know, if only we'd implemented Duffy Cahill, then this wouldn't be happening. But unfortunately, it hasn't, and we can't do it retrospectively, and there's nothing we can do. But in, in, in the motion, there isn't even a commitment to implement Duffy Cahill anymore. So the reality is the government is saying, yeah, there's nothing that we can do for these workers. Final thing I'd say is don't be disheartened by that for the workers. I'm sure they're not. They've seen this time and time again, but they know their actions are telling. It's why you had an offer a number of weeks ago, completely inadequate as that offer was. Keep up the action, keep up the strike, and keep up the protests, and uh, concessions can be won. Grealish. But, uh, Ken, Carl, and Ken Carl, I want to thank the independent group for bringing forward this motion before the House today. The issue of protecting workers' rights in the event of a business folding has taken on a whole new urgency in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic. There have been huge losses suffered by Ireland's SME sector over the past six months or so, running into billions of euro, and many small businesses have, al have already been forced to close. Genuine fears have been expressed that some of the big retail chains, large employers, headquarters in other countries may use the cover of the pandemic to up sticks and leave Ireland. And if they see the likes of Debenhams getting away with not leaving, with not leaving up to their commitments and responsibilities, then there is every chance that they will try and take the same path. 
The Duffy Cahill report, completed in March 2016, produced a series of proposals and protections for Irish workers made redundancy, made redundant through insolvency. It aimed to avoid a repeat of the situation faced by the staff at uh, Clary's in Dublin, who were left high and dry after that company collapsed, leaving the state to pick up the pieces. Around the same time, Debenhams agreed, following negotiations with staff representatives, to a deal promising four weeks' pay per year of service to any staff made redundant. Yet here we are, four years later, and that deal has been thrown out the window, and the dust is still gathering on the Duffy Cahill report, with none of its many recommendations brought into law. To say the 1,000 or so Irish Debenham workers have been badly treated is an understatement. The offer made of an average of payment of 1,000 per worker on top of their legal minimum entitlement of two weeks' pay per year of service was by any yardstick an insult to their workers. The payment of the equivalent of an extra one day's pay per year of service was never going to be acceptable to staff, who only four years ago agreed in good faith to a redundancy deal promising them four weeks' pay per year worked. It only served to further inflame passions and widen the gap, the great gap that exists between the two sides. And as for the liquidators, KPMG, after withdrawing that parity offer to announce that no further settlement agreements would be negotiated by them with their employees, has, has further rubbed salt in the wound. The staff who were picketing outside the Debenham store in Galway and other uh, and others around the country are not asking for anything extraordinary, just, in the, just the entitlement that they were promised. And I want to compliment the staff uh, in Debenhams and Galway who uh, are protesting outside and doing a peaceful protest uh, in Galway in all sorts of weather. The Taoiseach himself, himself has described the treatment of Debenham staff as shabby, shoddy and unacceptable. But words alone will not improve their lot or the situation uh, potentially facing thousands of more employees of large retail chains in the months ahead. We need the protection suggested by the Duffy Cattle report to be put in place as a matter of urgency to ensure that if workers lose their jobs, at least they can be guaranteed a fair settlement after many years of loyal and dedicated service. While I support this motion, Ken Corla, I would be concerned if the establishment of a ring fenced insolvency fund would result in the employers being asked to foot the bill for it. Too many small and medium sized businesses are on their knees right now, desperately struggling to stay afloat. Between them, they have lost up to 10 billion euro between March and June alone, according, according to a study by the ESRI. The effects of the pandemic are likely to hit my home city of Galway more than any other major urban area in the country, according to a report from the Northern and Western uh, Regional Assembly. That report found that more than 46% of Galway's commercial businesses were operating in the, sect uh, were operating in the sect uh, sector set to feel the greatest economic impact of the pandemic, a higher proportion than Dublin, Cork, Limerick or Waterford. The last thing they need is a further levy on top of everything else that could tip them over the edge in terms of their survival. A new levy imposed employees, employers' pay-related social insurance would, in my view, achieve the opposite of what is proposed would hope to achieve. It could be the last straw that could send a business uh, to the wall, resulting in job losses and further hardship for the very people that this motion aimed to assist. And finally, Ken Carla, but as I said, I'm f I am fully supportive of the call to legislate for the implementation of the Duffy Cahill report recommendations and call on the government to act on this as a matter of urgency. Thank you very much, Deputy Grealish. We move now to the Rural Independent Group. Uh, Deputy Healy Ray, sharing with your three colleagues. Thank you uh, very much, Ken uh, Carla. Um, I'm glad to get the opportunity and thank the independent group for uh, organising this motion here this evening and relating to, to Debenham's workers who have, who I feel have been regarded because um, Debenham's, as, as, as it seems to be pointed out, are, have assets in, in other places and uh, they were supported very well in Tralee by the people uh, that uh, used to uh, buy, buy their, their, their wares in, in, in Tralee and the people of Tralee didn't let them down, didn't let them down, the workers 
in Debenhams and Tralee didn't let them down. And likewise here in Dublin, they didn't let Debenhams down here either. But they are being let down now by this uh, very wealthy uh, company. And seeing as, um, as the company are not for, 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 for KVN, the government should take some action to ensure uh, that the, the workers uh, get uh, fair uh, compensation and, and, and what has been offered is only paltry and, and is not acceptable and is not fair. And when we see these workers out on the picket lines day after day, um, it's, um, it's, it, it, we know the extent and, and the, 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 the horror that they, the horrible way that they have, have been treated. So um, I, I want to thank the independent group for bringing this very important motion forward and giving us the chance to support the Debenham workers uh, here in Dalian, which, we, which, we, which I and the rest of our group are gladly getting thank the you, your, your chance to do. Please. Thank you very much, uh, Count Caller, and could I thank most sincerely Deputy Collins and the independent group for bringing this motion before the House, because it is only right and just after the enormous campaign that these workers are after putting in that it is rightfully acknowledged here in the House, and I really appreciate that. I want to re relay one story to Deputy Collins and everybody else about the other night in Tralee, and I know you'll appreciate this very much. As you know, these days, thankfully, they're not too bad, but the nights can be pretty cold and it was half twelve or maybe quarter to one last Monday night uh, and going by where the Debenhams uh, protesters are protesting during the day I couldn't believe it there was a number of people there maintaining their vigil uh, uh, protesting through the night and uh, I stopped of course to say a few words to them of support and encouragement and, uh, and I relate the fact that this was coming before the House by your group here this evening, and of course they appreciate that. And it's only right and proper that we all support it. I can't believe that a group um, that are as, we'll say, financially strong, I can understand and appreciate if a company or a business goes broke, and if there's no money in the kitty, and if the whole thing has gone wallop, and if people can't be paid, and if, 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 the, if the well is just dry, well, well then that's a different story. But we know that there are enormous amounts and value of stock in those shops. And as far as I'm concerned, those goods that haven't been removed and that, that the good workers uh, insured weren't removed, uh, that that is actually the property of the Debenham workers. And it is the property of the people who served and gave their years of genuine service to that company and then have been treated so badly. What I can't believe is how the company are being so stubborn in spite of the massive swell of support that's there for the workers, why they're doing this. I, I really can't get my head around that. I don't want to eat into anybody else's time, but thank you very much. Thank you very much. I would like to uh, thank Deputy Collins and the independent uh, group for this motion today. Former Debenhams workers in Cork are carrying out a 12-hour fast whilst on a picket line today in order to raise funds for Marymount Hospice in the city. They feel that the people of Cork have been so good to them that it is time now that they pay them back. This coming Thursday will mark 161 days of industrial action taken by Debenhams workers, which brings us in line with the Vita Cortex workers who ended their action after 161 days. The former Vita, Vita Cortex workers say they are totally behind the Irish Debenhams employees um, as they continue to fight for their entitlements. They have said we support Debenham workers in their fight for fair treatment. Workers should not have to go to such lengths to secure uh, a just outcome. We are calling on the government to listen to the requests of the Debenham employees, and many of them I know, even all the way down, some of them are working all the way from Castletown Bay uh, in, in Cork and Debenhams Cork. The members of the government who stood with Debenham workers on the picket line and pledged their support but have disappeared need to come out in support uh, of this call and ensure that proper redundancy is finally given to these workers. Uh, this dispute has put tremendous pressure on these workers. It is now time for the government to step up and finally give these workers what they are owed. They are now involved in the longest running industrial action this state has ever seen, and it is time for the government to intervene. Put it into this and give the Demon workers what they are entitled to. Workers are giving up 
dozens of, of hours every week standing outside the stores nationwide to prevent stock from being removed uh, on site. It is understood that the stock across the Irish Debenham stores nationwide is wor worth in the region of £20 million. Workers believe the liquidated stock and cash in the stores should be going uh, into the Irish redundancy pot. Instead, 2,000 workers in 11 shops are facing into only receiving statutory redundancy. This dispute has put tremendous pressure on these workers. It is now time for the government to step up and finally give the workers what they are owed. Minister, the Debenhams workers are looking for nothing over the top. They are just looking for after their hard years' work, after their, what they have given back to the community, they are looking for fair play. Debenhams are not playing ball. Debenhams workers are protecting assets that are here in this country belong to Debenhams to try and make sure that they get a fair deal. Irish have always been known for the fighting Irish, for fighting for the people of Ireland. It's about time that the whole of Ireland regrouped and fought for the Debenhams workers. We see people coming here every day trying to live and on what they have at the moment, dealing with COVID-19. And we see a disgraceful company like Debenhams put us to one side and say, we don't care. We look at social media and we look at what Debenhams sent out. If you have vouchers with Debenhams, you can buy on us offline, online. I'm asking the people of Ireland to send a clear message to Debenhams and a clear message to our government that we want Debenhams held to account. If it was an Irish company that were doing this, you would seize their assets and would you, we would hold them to account. Find a way to hold Debenhams to account and look after the Debenhams workers. They've paid tax in this country. They've looked after us, they've clothed us, and they've looked after the community. Debenhams have nothing but disrespect for Ireland. And it's about time now Ireland turned around and said, we are going to be disrespectful now to you and make you pay and hurt them in the pocket until they look after our Debenhams workers. I must congratulate the independent group for bringing this forward today. I support it 100%. And I thank the Debenhams workers for keeping the fight up. And we will send a clear message to Debenhams. You will not stand on the Irish, because we will stand on you. Thank you, Deputy O'Donoghue. <coughs> now, Deputy Thomas Springle, please. Sorry, Hank, I thought it was the government sums up first, isn't it? Oh. As we have two, we have two ten, uh, ten minutes left at the end. Well, they seem to have had two independent groups at the start. Uh, I'm just reading what's in front of me, so you're next up according to this. Next up, best dressed. <laughs> All right, OK. Um, I'll, go now, I'll go now then, so well, anyway. But, uh, look, I would like to fully support this motion. Um, I, would, I would like to pay tribute to Joan... Joan, Joan and the work, for the work she has done on behalf of the Debenhams workers. Do I, sorry, what, what do I have, 10 minutes? Well, I, was only work, I was only working on five minutes, so I'll have to speak slowly, speak slowly in some minutes. Um, so I would like to pay tribute to the, the Joan for the work she has done on behalf of the Debenhams Devon workers and bringing forward this motion tonight. And it is vitally important for all the workers to ensure that they would get some compensation when they are made redundant. The imp implementation of this motion and the recommendations of the Duffy Cahill report would do that. It would send out a strong signal that the Irish state respects its citizens. It would be a sea change for a government in this country to support workers and workers' rights. It would send a signal that this state thinks as much about citizens and workers as it does about companies. That, sadly, would be huge progress for workers. For too long we have protected businesses that have no interest in protecting or respecting their staff, and indeed in this case no interest in respecting or respect for our state either, you as defenders of the business of businesses. It must be a real shock for you as a government to realise that. Sadly, your government are happy to bend over for companies and businesses. The reality is that business and companies do not in the main have any interest in citizens or workers. Indeed, they don't have any interest in you either other than, than what you will do for them. And that is it. And for too long, 
the Irish government has based the fact on that the companies supply jobs, so therefore we should do everything for companies. And that the reality is that workers supply the jobs and make companies viable. And, and, do, and what we should be doing is looking after workers and companies side by side, and then we would actually see progress and see maybe an economy that works properly on behalf of all our citizens in, in the country. I listened to Minister English earlier on make the argument on behalf of Debenhams, and I was very disappointed. And he made the, ca he made the case then eventually for Fianna Fáil, Fine Gael and the Greens as well, wringing his hands and saying that there's nothing that he can do. The government, through all your spokespeople, are offering sympathy to the workers, but they deserve better than that. Debenhams today and future workers who will be in the situation that the Debenhams workers are in now are being let down by the delay in implementing the Duffy Cal report. But there is a possibility that if you acted and implemented the report now, the workers could, could apply under the Duffy Cal for payment of the redundancy that the company have, re have agreed to in the past. And that is what this motion is calling for. But every day you delay is making it more and more difficult for the workers to get any rights vindicated. The Minister says that the Government is going to review the Duffy Cattle report and see what can be done. But, but the reality, and you say it in your response to the motion, is that you have already done that and ruled it out. So which is it? You have ruled it out by the use of the Company Law Review Group, although it is isn't possible to find their consideration of the report on their website anywhere at all. So the fact of the matter is that if Duffy, Duffy Cahill had been acted on, and this was a report that was commissioned by two of your ministers, or the previous government ministers, it's basically the same government anyway, then the situation that has arisen for the, the Debenhams workers would not have arisen. Indeed, if the conditions would not apply, then so be it, but we cannot say that. The only thing we can sadly say is that, is that it hasn't been implemented. The only thing, thing that we, we can say is that, that this state does not care about workers. You will do what you can for companies, but not for workers. And it is not radical what this motion is calling for. It has already been done in a number of European countries, such, in, such as Germany, hardly a bastion of socialist principles. But they do know that business needs and survives better when workers are respected and treated fairly. And that is all that this motion is asking for. And that's all that anything, anybody that, we, that uh, uh, the Debenhams workers on the, on the picket line, and even the Cleary's workers, anybody else, all they're asking for is to be treated fairly and be treated with respect. And I think that the least that anybody as citizens of this country could expect is that our, our government would actually think about them as well and act on their behalf. Now, you can't, OK, you can't intervene in the law, and that's fair enough, and you can't intervene to get the, this sorted out. But what you can do is you can actually implement the Duffy Cahill report, and you can stop in the hypocritical way that you're dealing with it, where the minister is in here earlier on saying that he can't do it and he won't do it, and then your motion, the response to your motion says that you're already that it has already been ruled out. You know, so the, the least you could do is treat people with respect and treat them with clarity, give them the response and give them the review, and then see see where we go from there. I don't think it's too much to ask for anybody to be treated fairly, and it is time that we, as a state and a government, acted on behalf of our citizens. You will vote this motion down next week, as it will be now, rather than tonight, and your amendment is, is what will be on the record of this doll for all to see. It will show that Fianna Fáil, Fine Gael and the Greens care more about companies than citizens, and that's all it will show. And it will be a sorry memento of this government that that will be there. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Pringle. Now, uh, Mr Troy. Um, thank you, uh, Ken Corla. Um, I've listened carefully uh, for the last hour or so uh, to the concerns expressed by deputies this evening, and I too share their frustrations um, for the Debenhams workers and those facing job losses at this time. It is clear that any proposal to progress requires careful con consideration involving further consultation with many stakeholders on the recommendations in Duffy Cahill report. I would note uh, that the Companies Act 2014 already provides for, for court power to order the return of any assets improperly transferred in appropriate cases. That is already, applied, that is already given for uh, on the statute books. The Duffy Cahill report refers to an entirely different situation to that faced by the Debenhams workers today. The matter at hand is a court-supervised liquidation of a failed company with, as, as far as any of us knows, no, no other significant assets to dispose of apart from certain stock, the value of which is still under dispute, and a range of creditors who too have legitimate claims upon it. 
the, atten- the intention of this government, as set out in the programme for government's commitment regarding employee protections, is to review whether the current legal provisions surrounding collective redundancies and the liquidations of companies effectively protect the rights of workers, review the Companies Act with a view to addressing the practice of trading entities splitting their operations between trading and property, with the result being that trading businesses, including jobs, go into insolvency and the assets are taken out of the original businesses, and examine the legal provisions that pertains to any sale to a connected party following the insolvency of a company, including who can object and the allowable grounds of an objection. This is what we will do in terms of future legislation. Duffy Cahill is certainly part of that, uh, but not the whole part of it. And for my part, as the Minister with responsibility for company law, I don't want to wait any longer uh, for this to be conducted. I want to specifically note the Deputy's motion to examine the need for a ring-fenced insolvency fund such as exists in several European states to allow for all payments due to workers laid off by an insolvent company, which could be financed by a levy on employers' pay-related social insurance. I want to say this is an interesting proposal, and the Government considers it is worthy of detailed and serious consideration. A similar proposal has been made recently uh, to Minister English uh, by ICTU. I look forward to Government considering this proposal uh, with their input and the input of other informed parties, and this debate too uh, will feed into it. It has to be acknowledged that the proposal will have some obvious challenges, which would necessitate wider consultation, not only across Government, but but also among stakeholders such as employers who would be asked to pay into the fund. And we would be asking employers to pay into this fund at a serious challenge in time, in the, in the context of COVID, in the context of Brexit. And business failure doesn't help businesses, and it certainly doesn't help employees either. As I understand it, the proposal is essentially that a levy on private sector employers would be established with contribution rates in, in the order of 0.35% and 0.66% of wages which would be used in situations where an employer defaults on a collective collective agreement due to insolvency. Such a levy would potentially alleviate the extreme pressure coming upon the Social Insurance Fund and might offer a tailored solution to this particular scenario should it happen again in the future. I believe that currently the only non-social insurance fund charge collected with employer insurance, social insurance is the 1% National Training Fund levy, which is returned under the PAYE system to the Department of Employment Affairs and Social Protection and is subsequently transferred to the National Training Fund administered by the Department of Education and Skills. I am currently engaged with my colleague Minister English Uh, on how to progress consideration of the proposal, on revisiting Duffy Cahill and establishing the best way to do so in consultation with stakeholders. Engagement is key. I met with the the Debenhams workers with the Taunishta. I met them with my party colleague, Deputy uh, McAuliffe. I have engaged with Deputy John Lahart uh, on this matter also. And today, together with Minister English, um, I am finalising a multi-stakeholder forum to ensure appropriate recommendations are carried forward and given statutory funding or, and put on a statutory This will necessitate the engagement of all stakeholders, union representatives included. And I have already, uh, in my negotiations or talks uh, with some unions, informed them of this. Uh, the Duffy Cahill report will be foundational in this regard and be, will be utilised to realise the commitments made in the programme for government uh, without further delay. I want to again extend my sympathy to the employees at Debenhams Ireland who have lost their jobs and acknowledge the distress and the worry that this is causing for them and indeed for their families. The workers will receive uh, their statutory entitlements. However, anything additional uh, to that uh, can only be secured in nego- through negotiations between the unions, the liquidators, uh, consulting, in good, consulting in good faith um, with one another. And we have, and I have heard, and rightly so, 
uh, from many people on the opposition benches um, the need and the right for employees to have access to union representation. Um, these workers have access uh, to union uh, representation. The union uh, has been uh, in, entered into consultation on behalf of the workers. And we continue to encourage this, and um, we hope uh, that they will come out with a successful outcome. But we can't dictate that outcome, nor should anybody on that side of the House try to dictate uh, that outcome. It should be left uh, to the unions representing uh, their workers. And there are other uh, avenues at the disposal of the unions and, uh, and at the disposal of the workers. And the Workplace uh, Relations uh, Commission stands ready and available should the unions uh, representing the workers wish to use uh, this arm of the state. A further key point I want to uh, mention is that de the deputies who are seeking an immediate emergency legislative solution that would apply to these retrospectively as a special case over and above many other workers who have been made redundant. Um, this approach is on shaky grounds in terms of legality and policy. Uh, retrospec retrospectation has obvious legal issues but I would also question uh, the wisdom in setting one class of worker over another class of worker. For present purposes, the reality of the government's position is that it has no statutory role or power to intervene in the distribution of assets that is currently under a court-supervised liquidation. To suggest um, otherwise uh, would be misleading. And the government does not have the luxury of the same that members of the opposition parties who can make promises who know that they don't have to uh, carry out. The government has to and must operate within the confines of existing law. The government's role in respect of the Debenhams workers is to ensure the redundancy pay payments are made uh, from the Social Insurance Fund, that the workers are supported by the purposes by the for the purposes of job seeking supports, including retraining, and that in depth consideration is given to the company law and employment rights uh, law issues set out in the programme for government. Uh, Minister English and I, as I said already, uh, Minister English and I, as I've said, will uh, continue to pursue, pursue the relevant programme for government com commitments. Will revisit Duffy Cahill and assess which elements can, can help address the shortfall which arose in respect of Cleary's and consider the proposal for a, a levy and engage with the stakeholders uh, on this. As I said, we are already finalising a multi stakeholder forum. Um, it is my intention that that will commence within weeks, um, not in months, and, and I am determined to ensure that we can. Uh, pursue uh, policies uh, for the protection of workers uh, in the not too distant future. Very good. Uh, Deputy Collins. Take my mask off, sorry. Um, with all due respect to the Minister uh, Damien English and to yourself, uh, uh, Minister Troy, um, the fact that Leo Varadkar tarnished is not in this chamber, I think it's not just Showing contempt for the opposition on the left, but we're well used to that at this stage. Um, but Leo Vradker is showing contempt for the former Debenham workers, the thousand former Debenham workers, um, and that has not gone unnoticed. And, so, and also showing disrespect to the workers in St Mary's in um, nursing home who are facing the possible uh, situation of liquidation by the Sisters of Charity um, who are using. Um, the fact that if they have to pay redundancies, they would be bankrupt, but they haven't even gone into that situation yet. So these people are watching and seeing exactly what other companies have done. Um, and we know that the past issues were uh, HMV, Lasanza, Connolly Shoes, Game, Paris Bakery, Talk Talk, Cleary's, now Debenhams and St Mary's. And we know there will be future uh, situations, we, as I said, the 69,500 co uh, companies are are on the um, emergency wage um, schemes, and these are going to be affected when these are cut very badly. Um, clearly, this government 
of Fianna Fáil who are 10% of the polls and would normally have their finger on the pulse on these things because the Devon supporters are hugely supported by the people of this country. The public support is absolutely massive. And you would normally have your finger on the pulse of that, but obviously you don't because otherwise you'd be looking at this situation. From 93 days ago, in your programme for government, where you said, uh, and I'm not even going to read from the programme from government, actually, I'm going to read from the uh, terms of reference of the Duffy Cattle Report. Uh, hence, the focus of the examination is how the, how the legitimate interests of employees could more effectively be safeguarded in situations in which collective redundancies arise from the liquidation of an employer following corporate restructuring in assets, assets which might otherwise have been available to protect those interests are, are transferred to a related person. Now, I'm looking at your Mealy Amendment here, where it says, um, I don't think I'm actually losing the page. No, I haven't. Um, where it says, for the notes, the government is committed to and is determined to deliver on a number of actions in the programme for government, including to review whether the legal provisions surrounding collective redundancies and the liquidation of companies effectively protect the rights of workers. That was four years ago, the Duffy Cattle Report. This is 93 days ago, and we still have nothing to protect workers that are facing technical insolvencies. And I think you should be ashamed yourself of, of, as government to be standing here saying you're going to review the same thing that Duffy Cahill were to review, that you reject it, and now you're going to review it again. And then you're going to review the Companies Act, who you say in your, in, in your uh, amendment uh, the CL, the Company uh, Law Review Group, did not include the implementation of the Duffy Cal report and its recommendations. It didn't, because there was no reference, terms of reference for them to look at that. That was completely different. But you're using it then to say that uh, the, uh, the company uh, CLRG um, did not include that. I think the double speak of government is just horrendous. And workers, and those workers on the picket line, whose lives have been disrupted for 160 days because the law allows companies to legitimately, uh, uh, technically is, in, insolve their companies to take any monies away that those workers can call on is absolutely reprehensible. You're talking about the review of the Duffy Cal report we had it, that would be taken in, in conjunction. It's there for four years, Minister. Really, you should be ashamed of yourselves um, in relation to this. Now, the Debenhams workers, this is what time I have left, um, the, Deben the Debenham National Shop Stewards Committee has unanimously endorsed a mandate ICTU campaign to secure urgent legislation um, in relation to the Duffy Cattle Report and the uh, suggestion that we have in our, uh, in our motion in relation to um, uh, ring fence and so uh, uh, an insolvency fund um, such as exists in several other European countries. Um, they have put their name to that uh, campaign now, the Devlin workers, and they're saying we want the government to urgently bring in legislation to enact the Duffy Cattle Report for the government to pay the two weeks plus that they should be getting as part of their four week, and then for the government to pursue Debenhams under that legislation. That the, the, the fact you could, uh, uh, I'm sure the government could go to the liquidator and ask them to extend the length of time for the liquidation to allow that legislation to be enacted. That's what the workers are looking for. That's what Mandate are looking for. That's what ICTU are looking for. That's what they've said to you. That's what they've said to Damien English. That's what they've said to Varad Leo Varadkar. That's what they want. They want to walk away from those picket lines. They don't want to be there until Christmas. As I was talking to the shop steward earlier on in Henry Street, and she said, if the Duffy Cal report had been, had been implemented, they wouldn't be contemplating having their Christmas dinner on the picket line. Because that's how far and how strong they are. They are not going to walk away from that picket line. They are not going to walk away from the assets that are in, in those shops because they know that that's potentially their, uh, the, uh, an asset that the government could go after and to, um, to pay them. Now, I actually read through the company law review report. It is actually on the, I Googled it. Um, it's over 120 pages long. And it went through all the things that, uh, Duffy Cattle went, went, looked at in relation to um, the company law and Deputy Con Connolly raised some of those points with uh, section 608 or whatever and 599 and um, never once and, and, and you have <laughs> the audacity to put in, in, in here the CLRG did not include the implementation of the Duffy Cattle report in its recommendations 
there is not one mention of the Duffy Cattle report in that report from the company's um, review. Uh, not one, because I wasn't asked to. They were dealing specifically with company law in relation to how it would impact, and they recommended no new recommendations, even though ICTU did challenge some of them uh, recommendations or didn't agree with the recommendations. But they, ne they made no recommendation to change that law because they said that the, the company law was there, it can be used, it can be effective, but costs were key to it. So, as far as workers can see, and this is not about John Collins and, and the private members' bill and whatever, this is what the workers want to be brought into the doll, to be discussed and debated and for the government to respond. That they want this legislation. They want their jobs protected. They want their conditions protected. They want their contracts protected. That they've signed in good faith with companies that can well, that can well afford to pay their workers. Um, so, Minister, I urge you, um, I was hoping, as I said earlier on, that we would have the Tarnister coming in and saying we're seriously looking at how we can speed up things here. We seriously know that these workers could be left um, with only two weeks of the statutory. Um, and we want to get them their holiday pay, we want to get them everything that they're entitled to. Um, and we, we are looking at the Duffy Cal report implemented immediately. Um, and how we can do that, and we're going to get all our legislators and our people around us that can actually sit down and do that over the next two weeks. The point has been made. We brought in massive legislation overnight in this stall to bail out the banks. We sat here until about five o'clock in the morning, bringing that legislation through, to bail out the banks. And yet, workers have been out for 160 days, We've had 93 days since your programme for government and workers are still on the picket line fighting for their rights and what they're due. So, Minister, I would ask you to go back to your own party, number one. Um, I heard a party member on the radio not so long ago, I think it was yesterday, um, saying that he was um, saddened that the Fianna Fáil party seemed to be losing uh, its contact with its roots. That's an older party, and they're not recruiting young people. Why would young people when you're not representing them uh, from the point of view of their contracts? Um, so, Minister, I really do appeal for you to take this more seriously and implement what the workers, what mandate, and what the Irish Congress of Trade Unions are asking for. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Collins. Um, that concludes our second stage uh, consideration of the proposal. Uh, the question now is that the amendment be made. That's an amendment in the name of the Minister, I take it. Um, is that agreed? Minister's amendment is made? Not agreed. Not agreed. The deputies who are in favour of the making of an amendment to say Tha. 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 Okay, insofar as the vote has been demanded, the vote is carried forward now until the designated voting time next uh, next week. So we must now, I'm afraid, take another 20-minute sanitisation break. Our apologies for that. We will be returning then to statements on protecting jobs and supporting business.